make sure you guys ask questions. There's no dumb question. Just raise your hand. They'll be glad to ask you. It's all yours. The floor is yours. Okay, thanks. Well, again, thanks for inviting me, and I uh, appreciate it. Um, just to get some other formalities out of the way, there's business cards there, and Southeastern Liquidators sponsors me. So does uh, Cabo uh, Real. So um, if you have any questions about equipment or where to get some equipment, uh, I definitely recommend Southeastern. I was asked by Steve to come up here and talk to you guys about inshore fishing. That's my forte is Tampa Bay. My area of expertise is anywhere between downtown Tampa and just the other side of the Skyway Bridge. From listening to you guys, it seems like we have quite an assortment. Most, uh, it seems like a lot of people know some stuff. Other people are still learning. So again, like Tiger said, if there's any questions whatsoever you have, feel free to ask me. Um, Steve kind of said, well, maybe cover what you're going to be doing for the next two days, two week, two months. Um, I, I fish pretty much the same. The, the big things that I can tell you is tides, and that's why I brought this tide chart here. I fish today, and uh, the most important thing about fishing Tampa Bay, and I think just about anywhere unless you're offshore, is the tides. So I almost structure my... <coughs> fishing trip around the tide. So if you look at that tide today, and this is the name of this website I wrote on the top is Rod and Reel Tide Chart, but you don't necessarily have to go to Rod and Reel. If you find another tide chart that works great for you, go ahead and use it. But I use these, and I've got three ring binders full of pages of these because, as I was mentioning a couple other people earlier today, what I like to do is, after the day's trip, I go ahead and if you're not computer savvy, you can go ahead and do it in handwriting. If you can go ahead and cut and paste, cut and paste that time chart, stick it on a Word document, and then you can go ahead and type in your stuff nice and neat. Sometimes I do. I have some handwritten stuff where I just don't have time to do it. But there's important things you learn every day out there fishing, and a lot of it is about the tides. So today, for instance, I was up at 5 o'clock this morning, and I dropped the boat in the water, and loaded up all my gear, and before the sun was coming up, I was easing out of the canal. I live on the water in Apollo Beach. I've lived there since 1990. I bought my house there on the water. And um, I ran out to my first bait spot, okay? And someone was saying, bait's the tough thing. Well, it can be the tough thing, but sometimes it can be easy. But I went up to my first bait spot, anchored up next to a channel marker, and started chumming. And I threw the net, and all I got were big horsemen, I mean big sardines like this, huge ones. And they're great if you're fishing for tarpon or grouper or really big snook or something like that, a big, big red fish. But today's trip was somewhat novice, and they just wanted to catch a lot of fish. They wanted to catch fish to eat. They wanted bluefish, mackerel, that sort of stuff. They're two Vietnamese. One didn't speak any English. The other one was the wife of a... Marine veteran from Vietnam, and they wanted to keep everything. They kept my bait fish. <laughs> they kept the bait fish too. They say they fry them up and they're crispy, and they say, hey, whatever, it's, it's okay. But getting back to the the tides, if you look at five o'clock, the tide was coming in pretty strong. So to get bait, we're anchored up current from this channel mark here. I'm chumming and throw the net and you know, big baits. So it's not going to work for catching bluefish and mackerel. You need smaller bait fish. So I went to my next bait. I went to five bait spots the last time I went. And I'll tell you where I got bait at so you guys know, but I got off Cockroach Bay flat. I was down there and it was, I had to pick up at 8.30 and it's 7.30 <coughs> and here I am there and I got to be back in Apollo Beach at 8.30. So I zipped into that flat and I started chumming again and just little pinfish, little pinfish. The bait fish showed up, I got the bait. Now, if you take a look at that, I, I called and said, hey, I'm going to be 15 minutes late, by the way. But we got plenty of bait, went to pick them up. And on this time chart, you can see that this is at Shell Point, okay? So at Shell Point, at 9 o'clock, 9, 11, is high tide. Now, when do you want to catch, when do you think the fish are going to bite? Just looking at that tide chart, who can tell me? When are the fish going to bite? I picked up at 8.30. Pretty good time. 
Yeah, the main thing is you want moving water. How about it's 7? 7 o'clock in the morning would have been good. 7 would have been good. 7 to 8 would have been good. Um, 11 to 2 was great. But here's the thing. That's Shell Point. And this is something that you have to learn is that we didn't fish here at Shell Point. We ran south all the way down by Joe's Island where the tide has is, is already started moving out. So what you want to do is you want to follow your tides. And that's how you plan your trip. You see, because the tide up here is an hour later, over an hour later. And it's the most important thing you do. So you take a look at the tide and you plan your trip. If you want to fish that outgoing tide, you're going to fish it all day long. You're going to fish that outgoing tide on a day like this, because I'm fishing from basically 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock. You see, 3 o'clock's the low tide. So in order to do that, you go down south where the tide's moving, and you follow that moving water all the way north. The last spot we fished was up off of McDill, close to downtown Tampa today. But we started down there. So my point is about tides, and it's regardless whether it's the next two months or it's any time of year, tides are probably the most important thing that you're going to use to catch your fish. The next thing that you're going to use is the knowledge that you develop. And that's why what I do, again, is I make notes. We started off down south by Joe's Island. Off of Joe's, there's an area down there where there's some rocks and some grass. <coughs> And we were catching mackerel and bluefish like crazy for the first hour. You know, so from 9 to 10 there, and that's what I would do. I would make a note, 9 to 10, Joe. You know, or if you have a GPS and you GPS that spot that you're going to go to, which is another great tool on your boat, GPS, and mark that number. I was a GPS spot 26 or whatever you want to name it. Bite was fantastic from... 9 to 10. It started to slow down there. Well, the tide has slowed down a little bit. There's not a lot of water movement. When you look at that, what's the range in water movement from 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock? A little better than half a foot. A half a foot. Over how many hours? Six hours. That thing's barely moving, right? So you got to maximize that tide movement to catch your fish. It's a tough day fishing today, really, when you take a look at this chart, because you don't have a lot of movement. So you always want to be where the water's moving the most. So we went from there north to a place off Pinellas Point, a little north of Pinellas Point. Boom, boom, boom. Mackerel like crazy. A couple big trout and uh, Spanish mackerel. And then it died. North again. Again, you're following the tide. So Probably the most important thing I can relate to you is tides. Pay attention to the tides, and then document what you're doing, too, what you did at the end of the day, and stick this in a folder. I use a, a three-ring binder with each, has 12 dividers, one for each month, okay? And I'll write down also on the back of this where I caught my bait, because see, I struggled today. The bait was over at this marker, two days ago. It's not there. Just big baits now. So now I'm getting small baits there. Water temperature is 84 degrees. Wind was out of the east at 5 miles an hour this morning. So all those things you make notes of here on your back of your page, either handwritten or type them in, and then you can use that the next time you go fishing. You've got spots, you've got water temperature, you've got where you've got your bait, what you caught. So that, that's probably the best thing I can tell you is log this stuff. And then you can go back month by month. You know, water temperature, you know, spots you went to that were productive. Tomorrow I may not go to any of those spots. I may go to some other spots. Some are going to produce. Others didn't. We went to several spots today. We didn't catch, didn't have a bite. Those are also in your notes, you know. Hey, John, does, yes. the, does the bait move with the tide as well? <clears throat> the bait moves with, wa with water temperature, number one is the main factor is water temperature, and then there's also a hatch. Um, the way it works is uh, typically this time of year, there's bait on the flats and on the channel markers. You know, from probably um, March through the end, of, uh, the end of September. You know, and then it starts going to deeper water because as the water temperature cools, it either goes back into the rivers 
where it goes into deep water like the center of the shipping channel or off out to the skyway. And there's also a hatch that happens. Right now, some of those bigger baits like this, it's another thing that I do too, is when you're fishing and you're in a slow spot and you're not getting a bite, one of the best tools I have is a pair of, pair of shears that I, you know, you can get them for like three bucks at Southeastern Liquidators. And I must have 10 pairs because the only thing that's going to happen is the price is going to go up on those <laughs> things. I dropped one in the water today. But you, you get those things and you just start cutting up your bait fish. And you can see it going out with the tide. Well, that brings all kinds of fish in. You know, chumming's another thing I'll get into in a minute. But getting back to where the bait is, those bigger baits, when I was cutting them open, they had row in them. They had little rows. So there's going to be a hatch that's going to happen here pretty soon. And you'll see a bunch of little bait on the flats. And I have, I have probably at least seven cast nets. Um, and they're not cheap. They're, you, you can't buy a cheap cast net. You have to have a good cast net. Um, Southeastern sells some good cast nets. Lee Fisher, uh, Calusa is a good cast net. Uh, but it, what varies is the mesh. I've got some for real deep water when it's cold, and they're at the bottom of some 25-foot channel markers. And that's where the bait is. And it's a one inch stretch and it's a 12 foot net. And then I have some that are eight foot that are a quarter inch mesh for the grass flats. When that hatch happens, what happens if you throw your net out there on the grass flat and you got these little baits and you got a three eighths mesh, you're gonna pull that thing up and it's gonna look like a Christmas tree. They're all gonna be gilled in there and every one of them are gonna die, you know? so. You gotta have the right size net, and I recommend having at least a quarter inch and having a three eighths inch net to net your bait. Um, any questions about getting bait? It seemed like you guys were having some trouble getting bait today. Is that right? Okay. One of the things to do is uh, tropical fish food, and you can get it at Ace Hardware up on um, Big Ben Road. They have it there, and it's a you have that. Here's where I would tell you to go, and I, I don't mind sharing spots. Um, you know where the entrance is to Cockroach Bay? Mm -hmm. From there, all the way down to Port Manatee, where the port is. That whole flat right now has bait on it, okay? What you want to do is go inside of the Manatee markers, okay? How shallow draft is your boats that you guys have? Pretty shallow? Go okay, well... So you don't have a problem. Get up on your bow, and, you know, as close as you can. Have somebody out along unless you have a tower. And what you're looking for is good grass. You know, there's different types of grass. There's total, turtle grass, there's shoal grass, there's eel grass. You want to find some nice grass. You don't want to find the stuff where there's a bunch of... Monkey uh, snot. Sh monkey snot, yeah, that's a good word it for it. Yeah. Schmegma is what I call it. But, you know, it, there's just this, you know, that's... That, that stuff that's growing all over. Stay away from that because you'll throw once and you'll have a long time cleaning out your net. So you want to go ahead and look look on the grass where there's some clean grass. And I start off probably about four feet of water to this deep. But as the water temperature warms up, the bait likes to hold in a little deeper trough. So you'll see these little white patches, little we call them potholes. So if you're in some, around some of that good grass and you get on the edge of a pothole, anchor up, and again, tide's important. So the tide's going out, okay? So you anchor this way. Here's the pothole over here. You're chumming to the edge of that pothole. You can actually see the bait fish swimming around the edges of that pothole. And what I do is I always have a five-gallon bucket on my boat. And I pour in, I, I use gallon Ziploc bags, and I usually have at least two of those Ziploc bags full of that chum. And I'll pour a quarter of it out, splash a little water in there, mix it around. And today I use the knee soil, which smells like licorice. But if you've ever grabbed a bait, it smells like licorice. And it attracts them. So you can get it online. I bought, I think, 15 bottles for... I don't know, I think it's $45 or something. You don't need much. You just shake a couple little drops in there, a little bit of water, 
and you make it to where it's, you know, still light and fluffy, you know, not real wet. And then I just start chumming it, and you can see it going with the current, okay? And as it goes with the current, you'll see a slick that goes back there, okay? If you look way at the back of your slick and you just keep constantly chumming in the back, chumming in the back, chumming in the back, that slick, you'll start to see some dimples way back there. And eventually, they'll come right there behind your boat. One of the key things is let them build confidence. Don't just start throwing that, throw some chum and start throwing the net. Wait till they come in. Wait till you see at least a you know, couple dozen of these bait fish swimming into that chum, and then you can go ahead and cast. And as soon as I throw the cast in, I grab a handful of that chum, and I throw it right back over the net, and then I bring that in, dump those out, and I'll chum for a while. And the next thing you know, there's two dozen, three dozen, four dozen, and then more and more. So that, that's the best way I can tell you to chum. So, and here's the other thing that's really key. Well, guides don't even do this, okay? This is a key thing to do. If you don't have two anchors, then get one of those sticks. You know, the uh, stickums, the, uh, I don't even know what the heck mine's called. It's a wang. A wang, mm -hmm. okay? Your anchor's here. The current's pulling the boat this way. Tide's going that way, right? With that anchor, that boat's swaying from here over to Walter. <laughs> so, so when you get ready to throw that net, if you're over by Walter and you've been chumming over here, you know, all that bait's there. So what you do is you get that wang and you stick it right beside the boat and tie it off on the side cleat so your boat doesn't move. That boat is right there. Because you move five feet this way, and I don't know how good you guys are at throwing cast nets. I mean, I can open up like a pancake. But, you know, if you're, if you're only open up as big as this table and you move that much, you're not going to get any bait. You're just going to scare them, you see. So those are the key things about getting bait right there. Um, if, uh, if, if the maximum flow for your fishing is later in the afternoon, let's say 3 o'clock, right? you determine that's the time you need to be out there to, to take advantage of the flow, can you still catch the bait fish, you know, like at 2 or 1.30 with that technique? What I've found is that, uh, and this is funny, Mother's Day, my wife wanted to go out on the boat. So we went out in the afternoon at 12 o'clock. And I was down there at Cockroach Bay. She's sunning, reading a magazine, and you know, I'm pulling my hair out because I just can't sit there and do nothing. So I'm going to grab some chum and I started chumming. <laughs> and the bait showed up, and it was like 12, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay? So I thought, great, I can get bait this spot. So for my charter the next day, I ran down, I marked that spot, went right down that same exact spot, and I couldn't get it before the sunrise. Don't know why. Again, I had to go to another spot. Remember I mentioned about GPSs? GPS, if, uh, if you're on a spot like that, where you get bait, mark it. Mark bait. Mark the temperature on your GPS. Okay? Because you'll find that temperature there, you can go somewhere else and go to that. So you want to do that again. You know, so you have a bunch of bait spots. Because like I said, I went to five of them today before I loaded up on bait. And as you said, bait is key. Tide is, you know, probably the most important. But if you don't have bait, you're not, you know. I'm not an artificial guy. I do probably 95% of my fishing with, with live bait. Um, today, though, um, the tides were slow. And these mackerel were looking for something that was moving, you know. So I put on a Clark spoon. <coughs> and we caught a bunch of bluefish and mackerel on a Clark spoon today. But we were also catching them on the live bait. How did you know they were looking for something moving? Well, because when she was reeling, she, we'd get a hit. So, and when it was just sitting there, and they were buried in the grass, it was nothing. But when she started to move, she caught a fish. Let's try a Clark spoon. Toss it out, boom, boom, one after another. So again, it's it's paying attention to what's going on too. Um, what I'm going to be doing for the next two months, I'll be fishing for the same thing: snook, redfish, trout, mackerel, um, flounder. When grouper starts up, I'll go ahead and fish for grouper, and I fish for grouper, um, you know, in the shipping channel. I've got spots that are in 20 feet of water that I troll for too. Um, I do use live bait, and I use uh, artificial for grouper. Um, when it gets really hot, 
you know, dead sticking. You know, who knows what dead sticking is? Okay, dead sticking, for those of you that don't know, it's when you've got a bait fish and you actually kill it. You know, you use a dead bait. And what I do is I cut off the tail, cut off the head, put a hook on it with a split shot and toss it, you know, in an area where I know there's fish at, like redfish, snook, um, because they all hit dead baits. When that water temperature starts getting over 86 degrees, those fish do not want to work for bait. They're lazy. Another thing about these, uh, this time of year too, when it gets that hot, is that cool water, which means air conditioning. Like you guys walked in here, man, it feels good in here. Well, underneath those mangrove bushes, man, it feels good underneath there too. So, you know, if you can pick your times again, get up underneath those mangrove bushes and throw a dead bait up underneath there and so you'll, you'll catch redfish that way. And again, chumming. Redfish are bottom feeders. Their nose comes over their mouth like that and they're always rooting around. I cut them open, I see little tiny crabs and stuff. I always open up the bellies and see what they've been eating. And another thing, those, those scissors that I told you about where you keep cutting up the bait, sling them out there by the mangrove lines. Okay, sling them out in an area where you cut up little chunks of those bait fish, pinfish, and everything else, and sling them right along the edges of the mangroves. And then take your bait, live bait and a dead bait, and throw it there and sit. It takes them a while to smell that, but they'll come up and get it. You may get a catfish or two, but believe me, the redfish will come in there and they will eat. And then what you do is, again, GPS. That's a spot for me. Caught redfish there. It's high. Was it? Incoming tide was an outgoing tide. Make your notes. Yes, sir. What's the question on that? I've noticed when we use cup that we use uh, pinfish, ladyfish, throw mm -hmm. tips. Never really use too much white bait. It's almost seems too clean. Do you do any good on cut white bait? You're, I, I've caught them on cut bait, on, on white bait, but you're absolutely correct. Threadfin is much oilier. Pinfish work great. Ladyfish works great. Sardines, not so much, but here's the deal. When I'm cutting up and chumming, okay, I'll cut up the sardines too and toss those out there. And I've cut I've cut up my redfish. You know, after I'm, I go back and I'm filleting the fish for the guys, I cut the belly open and there's little chunks of sardines, threadfin in their bellies, and they hit a live bait. And they hit a live bait. So, yeah, they'll eat it. I don't it's it's almost like, it's, I think it's more of a confidence thing for me. Like, yeah, the yeah, white bait is a little too clean. I think right. There's a little greasy. There's not enough oil in it. Touch a white bait, your hands aren't slimy. You touch the thread fin or you touch the pin fish, and mm -hmm. they're all. Right. That's, maybe that's what it is. So, what other questions can I answer for, answer for you guys regarding fishing in Tampa Bay? Yes, sir. This time of year, we're, the, the redfish and the snook, they're still up underneath the uh, mangroves. They don't go out into deeper water at the edge of the flat. Well, they, they'll go out, um, they go out by the beaches too this time of year, down by Fort DeSoto, it's a great area to fish down there, I don't know if you've ever been down to Bunces Pass, but uh, all along there, if you look along the beaches, they're snooking those beaches right now too, because it's getting ready, to, it's almost their spawning time right now. Um, Port Manatee Island is another big spawning area. Um, you're right, they, they do like to go out, but I think there's a snook that, um, I, I call them residential fish, I guess. I mean, they're, they're residents, they don't move. I mean, I was down in one area and I saw 60 snook, the smallest one was probably 15 pounds and it wasn't two miles from here, you know? And it was back by the mangroves, you know, on the flat. Even so, in the season. Yeah. Do you have a strong opinion about incoming versus outgoing tides? It seems like oysters, uh, people are really religious uh -huh. about one or the other, but then they, the, the general philosophy is if the water is moving, the fish are going to bite. So how do you feel about that? Well, I think you need incoming spots and you need outgoing oh, spots. So. <laughs> I have spots that are great incoming spots, great outgoing spots, but there's some that are good both ways. And again, that's where that log comes in real handy because you know if you if you charted where you were and what the tide was doing, you would know that this spot is a outgoing spot. You know the other spots a incoming spot. There's an area down south um, 
where the point of this area is a great outgoing spot. I've always, I mean, I always catch snook there. Guaranteed, guaranteed snook spot, always. But I've never caught a snook on incoming tide there. But you just go in this inlet, take a left, and over on the left-hand side, it's an incoming spot, and I catch fish on the outgoing there, too. So I, I think it's, um, it depends where you're at uh, as far as the tide goes. Um, and I, I'm trying to think what other... I, per, personally, I, I probably prefer an incoming tide uh, as opposed to an outgoing tide, um, except for real big snook. Real big snook fishing, I kind of like an outgoing tide a little bit more. What about um, Upper, Upper Bay Tarpon? Wait, I just moved on the Alafi River. Mm -hmm. And I hear later in the tarpon season, they say when they, after a June full moon, so the tarpon will disappear for a couple weeks. And is that when you'll start looking in the upper, like, because we went and scouted Hills of Royal Bay and didn't see anything? You know, I'm not a real big tarpon oh. guy. Um, I've caught them mainly not fishing for them. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm fishing for trouts and all of a sudden, yeah. boom, 120 pound tarpon, you know, it's on a, you know, a rod like that there, you know, and your customer's like, you know, we jump on snapper fish. So. You know, yeah, it's just crazy, but, um, the, the tarpon actually run up and down the six foot ledge. You know that manatee ledge mm -hmm. where they have that six foot ledge? Right. They'll run right along there from March through uh, through right now. Yeah. And uh, in June, July, um, I think that you know right now they're offshore. They're they're by the Skyway Bridge right now. Right. A lot of my friends are doing tarpon fishing by the Skyway Bean Point. Yeah, so we've done the beach. I just like this uh, somewhere closer where I can. Do a hill tide trip after work or something. They're right, like that. you know, little harbor, that that little inlet right there. In the winter time, I see them right there, and then yeah. they're rolling in the inlet. But I, I don't really don't target yeah. tarpon oh, so okay. much. <coughs> uh, <coughs> a lawn guy, shrub guy, John Richard said he was down at tar at uh, Boca Grande in one of the uh, tournaments here a couple of weeks ago. Right. And he said that they may be ending that because of the protesters cutting off the lines, going in front of the boats, slowing them down. Have you heard anything on that? I've heard they outlawed the jigging. They have a... Um, yeah, I knew that. There's a jigging, but I don't know about anything as far as... You know, Billy Nobles uh, was a, fishing down there. He had a great post on Facebook. Did, did you read that? Yeah. No, I, I didn't. The two, but, uh, two guys that are on like the Save the Tarpon yeah, board or whatever got guys that, fined by the FWC the for the illegal jig. The ones that to get this jig ban passed, yeah, but, but, and they're pushing for the pass of the jig ban. They just got fined by the FWC for using breakaway jigs, which are also illegal. But, huh. but you got to know the details. Right? You haven't heard yeah, anything about So them. my neighbor's in the PTTS, so we got kind of the details. And the jig isn't going away. The jig's been modified, uh -huh. so it can't break away. So yeah. the jig is still there, and those guys got caught using live bait right. on the on all weighted is, rigs that happen to break away. All it is so is it's, a, it's a breakaway rig that you can't have, be it a jig, be it live bait. You can't have breakaway. Yeah, years ago what we used to do is put, because I fish a little bit for tarpon down there, and you put a weight with a copper wire. That's what they got That's exactly around. what they got busted and on. That's the old school way, I man, when I was... Yeah, you know, twenty something years ago, copper was down there. <laughs> yeah. so you'd have that lead on there with a piece of copper, and when the fish hit it, you got so much force, you just throw that. Then you got a lead flying right next to your head. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the bottom line is, the jig is still there. It's just modifications to the jig that have been tweaked and whatnot. But it's it's all like you said. It's all about semantics. They, they are changing. Who's the trying to They're elbow still trying who to get out? Rid of the tournament. It's they a change whole. It. They don't weigh the fish in anymore because yeah, they're protesting because they're lip gapping them and which. It's Why are you going to lift out the tarpon? It doesn't mm -hmm. make any sense. Yeah. He, he mentioned something about there was the, the boats were more the people there uh, <coughs> in that area in a save the tarpon campaign. Right, right. There, it's a big turf war, and it's this is our house. Y'all can get it out, and they're the one trying to prove the band of this. It's a goat rodeo. They're going to tourism. <laughs> That's all it is. Right, it exactly. Is businesses. Yeah. It's a goat rodeo. All I got to say is good to be in Tampa Bay. Yeah. Well, they'll be here next. <laughs> If they get pushed out of there, they'll come here. Trust yeah. me. Well, Wherever the money's at, is where they're going to go. Right. Yeah. 
And, and it, if you've been out to the pass by Baines Point, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I was there last week. They were parked across the channel. I'm talking 50, 60 boats. And, and, and a 40-foot cat just ran right between all of them. Oh, yeah. And he didn't have much of a choice. But that's where the fish happened to be, and frankly, that's where we caught on. But anchoring in a channel, to me, is just insane. No, you should. All of them. It's illegal, isn't it? All of them were, were anchored up. I couldn't believe it. We drifted through, and we just had. And that's pass. almost a more to when you're running the boat, and you see a kayaker so. sitting in the middle of the channel just fishing. I mean, you feel like you're going to slip, but you're like, I shouldn't. So. You're you're in the middle of a channel. That's, yeah, that's, like, that's kind of a difference. Anyway, we need to get back there. That's a, whatever. Hey, John, kayaks are the cyclists of the waterway. The kind of fishing that you do. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, um, I'm a cyclist. Primarily, primarily for slowing down life everywhere. So yeah, you'll you'll be dead in two. I am. I, I can show you what I <laughs> use. This is my typical. Uh, Outfit here is I use. I almost ran over a kayaker. And this is for this was for mackerel today, but this is a 15 pound test braid, vicious braid line, and there's a 40 pound test leader with a, a long shank hook. So you use a 40 pound test fluorocarbon leader for the mackerel. Or the mackerel right through. Yeah, because they'll cut right through. They'll cut right through that, right through that like one or two. Your teeth that you see them, they're just razor sharp. What I found is that I'll get I'll get ten hits to one hit at least, maybe twenty hits with uh, yeah. fluorocarbon versus. That's uh, yeah. 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 I'm an old trout fisherman. I've always subscribed to the I mean, the smaller the leader, the less the. Oh, I agree with you. I agree. With but you. I don't know much about the, the salt water. Well, the problem is, is they have teeth. Yeah, they bite. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they they uh, they will go through uh, even a snook. If you get, I, I've got. We've caught, I guess in the last month or so, I've caught probably 15 to 20 snook that were over 20 pounds. And um, it's been a great year for snook. They're really starting to come back pretty strong. I'm sorry, did you say over 20 pounds? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And uh, That wasn't down a cockroach. And the, the thing is, they'll eat through the leader. So you're really fortunate to get fish in mm -hmm. that can bend, you know, because you, you got tremendous drag and they're heading right for those roots. And um, if you have 20 pound test leader, it's not going to happen. Where are you catching snook that big? <laughs> You're at the corner of the mouth. <laughs> book of, book of, <laughs> by the red marker. He'll show you that he'll take a half a day. Yeah, but book of charter. <laughs> West Coast of Florida. <laughs> Um, it depends what we're going for. So that, there's a kind of a. So there's a spot right there. Kind of a, February. I have a friend who's a doctor, and he's actually a brain surgeon. He brought one of his clients down, and, he said, and he's, a, he's a good friend of mine. He says, John, we need to hook this guy up and fish. So another captain buddy of mine, Jason Preto, and I went back into the river. It was February. And we were catching some small fish, and I said, I'm going to go over by the power plant and see if I can't get him on a real big fish. We hooked a fish. I thought it was a tarpon. It was uh, 48 inches long, wow. a little bit longer than that, maybe. And it was probably 35 pounds plus. That's a big one. It was the biggest fish, the uh, biggest snook I've ever That's a big caught. Thing. Posted that on the uh, Florida Guides Association How big website. Was it? How big was it? He was over 48 inches long, a little over 48. And I, I estimate probably, I've got a picture of it, probably 35 pounds plus. When did you catch him on? Caught him on a big sardine. Yeah. Big, big sardine. I find it's kind of a struggle to tie knots in leaders that are bigger than 30 pound cast. It's not really. Um, what knot do you guys use? 
some loop knots. Surgeon knot. Surgeon knot? Yeah. And then what this I can show you guys a couple of knots that I think are probably uh, much better than a surgeon's knot. Show us. Here's that. It's on show. so simple as a tie and I can use it, I can do it in my sleep. What do you think about um, braided line? That's all I use. Okay. Except for offshore sometimes they say, and I've, I've, I've used uh, some, a lot of monofilament. A friend of mine has the um, uh, motorized reels. Mm -hmm. You know, where you just push a button, mm -hmm. and so you really can't use that. But uh, I use braided. The, so the double uni works for braided to. Uh, it does. What you have to do, <coughs> what I do is I the, the braided line, like this 15 pound test braided line, has the diameter of about I think it's six or eight pound test. Mm -hmm. And so what you do is you take that line and you double it. Okay. Oh, okay. You double it. So All it's right. thicker. Mm -hmm. It's twice as thick. It's, it's basically idea. closer okay. to your leader. And then mm -hmm. you go ahead and tie your knot. That's a good idea. And I always start with the braid first mm -hmm. and then turn around and do the other one second. The thing about the double uni is you've got two knots that are coming together like this. Mm -hmm. It's not like this. Or, you know, twisted like, like a surgeon's either. Mm -hmm. It's two like this. So that's the beauty of that. Well, I guess that's about what it. Unless you guys follow it. Yellow. Yeah, this is a bright yellow. Well, that's an um, old guy. What are you, what are <laughs> I like I like that, uh, that moss, that green. But I use this because my clients a lot of times I tell them, well, there's your line over there, and you see your baits right here. Because the line went out there, and the tide's coming back. And and as long as you're, and that's another thing too. Did you notice the length of the leader? That, that leader's, you know, it's it's a, a little over three feet, three and a half feet long. So when a fish is looking at your bait, he's not going to see that line so much. He's, you know, a lot of people say, well, he's a little leader. Another thing with mackerel, too, is as a guide, you know, boom, he cuts you off. Well, I just cut it and tie a new one on. And when it gets down to about like that, you know, then I go ahead and retie the whole leader. No. no, I don't. If I'm getting cut off a lot, then I'll go to a 40. Typically what I use, my standard is 30. For a snapper, I'll, I'll use 20 because their eyes are really keen. Mangrove snappers seem to be the best bait stealers going, and their eyes are really keen. But when they're biting, I've caught them on the 40-pound test. Yeah, we had to drop down to 15 this weekend for a snapper. To get snapper, yeah. So you don't fish 20-pound leader? I do have 20. I do. Um, and if the fish are really particular, well, I'll try using 20 because a lot of times they'll see that other line. Yeah. But if you use some fluorocarbon, it, it's pretty clear. It's not too uh, visible. Even when you get to 30 and 40, it's not really too visible in the water. And you don't have any weight on that rig. I don't use any weight. So you're just throwing it out there. Mm -hmm. and you're now, I will use a split shot every once in a while. And when I'm using fish for snapper, I'll use what they call a knocker rig, mm -hmm. which, again, you could put a split shot on here, I mean a um, swivel on there, and use a swivel, mm -hmm. and then put a little, you know, one ounce um, uh, egg sinker with a, um, uh, maybe a bead that would go above the hook. And typically if you're going for snapper too, I use like a real sharp uh, owner hook, something, because they'll pack, they'll, well, you'll feel tap, tap, 
you know, it's got to be sharp to get them. Have you ever used the Nomatsu Octopus Circles for snapper? I have not. Yeah. Try it. Our hookup uh, ratio went from five to one to almost every fish. With really? The, what's the name of it? Uh, I think Gamagachi. 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 Octopus Circle Octopus. number one. Gamagachi. We've been, Gamagachi. That, Gamagachi. been they, that made our hookup ratio go. Big difference, huh? Yeah. It's almost like Gamagachi. a false. I can't explain it, but just grab a pack and try it next time you're I will. Fishing, cause okay. it's have you seen owners? Kimagachu. That's a long G word with ends with a U. Made in America. Yeah. Those guys that he took fishing. I use regular J hooks. I'm a J hook guy. Is it a circle or J? It's an octopus circle. It's almost a half and half. How do you hook? How do you hook the fish? That's what we're When I, a lot of times I'll use the belly hook, which is it's not really the belly. The, if you look at your bait fish, it has the pectoral fins here, you know, underneath it. And you literally go like right underneath the armpit through the other one. And when you throw that in the water, it'll make it dive. Okay. I do that for mackerel. When I'm fishing for uh, snook and redfish, I almost 90% of the time nose hook them. So the nose, you know? Yeah, but for mackerel and um, blues and kingfish and that sort of stuff. We caught, I mean, there's still kingfish in the bay. Uh, a couple years ago, we got a 50 pounder right off here, right off uh, Little Harbor, fishing for mackerel. Out in the channel? Right beside the channel, next to the channel. Yeah, 50 pounder. That was in July. Thank you for having me, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah.